So I would like to screen share a passage from, uh, from Susan Howe's My Emily Dickinson, and I'll ask uh, somebody in, the, in our Zoom to, to toss up a, a, a link in the chat so that others can look. But here's the passage I'm gonna show. So I'm gonna go to my how, here's my how, and now I'm gonna screen share, and there's my how. And I'll read it, uh, and then uh, to, I'll, I'll, I'll unshare, and I'll ask a couple of friends, let's say uh, Jess, Davy, and Allie to start with, just to respond to anything in this marvelous passage you know, the course begins with Dickinson, and here we are in week eight, and Susan Howe has her, my Emily Dickinson. Here's how, it's, here's how it goes. I might skip a, a little bit in this passage. As poetry changes itself, it changes the poet's life. Subversion attracted the two of them. By, 19, by 1860, she's talking about Dickinson and Whitman. <clears throat> by 1860, it was impo as impossible for Emily Dickinson simply to translate English poetic tradition as it was for Walt Whitman. In prose and in poetry, she explored the implications of breaking the law just short of breaking off communication with a reader. Starting from scratch, she exploded habits of standard human intercourse in her letters as she cut across the customary chronological linearity of poetry. Gertrude Stein, influenced by Cezanne, Picasso, and Cubism, verbally elaborated on visual invention. She reached in words for a new vision formed from the process of naming as if a first woman were sounding, not describing, space of time filled with moving. Repetition, surprise, alliteration, odd rhyme and rhythm, dislocation and deconstruction to restore the original clarity of each word skeleton, both women lifted the load of European literary custom that is Stein and Dickinson. Adopting old strategies, they reviewed and reinvented them. Emily Dickinson and Gertrude Stein also conducted a skillful and ironic investigation of patriarchal authority over literary history. Who polices questions of grammar, parts of speech, connection, and connotation? Whose order is shut inside the structure of a sentence? What inner articulation releases the coils and complications of sayings assertion? In very different ways, the counter movement of these two women's work penetrates to the indefinite limits of written communication. Wow, I'm sure everybody wants to say something, but let's have some brief comments from Jess, Davy, and Allie. Jess, what do you think? What would you like to say about that passage? Um, I mean, that, that was an extraordinary passage. Um, and I love that we're starting with it because Stein is such an important touchstone, um, you know, for the language poets. Um, and as you read that, it made me think of Stein's claim that she made the rose of English poetry read for the first time in like 200 years or something. Yeah. Um, so I think there is, there is this sense of, um, verging on non-communication to reach some kind of restoration or mm. um, some kind of word skeleton. Some... Yeah, that's a nice phrase. So you would say, despite what people think about this project, either Howe's or Dickinson's or Stein's, rather than it being destructive or tearing down, it is very positive, hopeful, and constructive. I mean, I know that's what you're saying, but I just wanted to ask you that. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, I think it's, you know, it's sort of both at once, but you know, like Stein was interested in disrupting things for the sake of making something new, you know. Right, right. And new has a positive valence, um, or did then anyway. Davy, your thought on this? I guess my thought on this is that we see in this passage, uh, Susan Howe reaching back through a genealogy that includes Stein and Dickinson to think about the question that's variously interesting to um, different language poets and folks sort of vaguely associated with language poetry. And it's a question that just as a shout out, um, Amber Rose does a beautiful job of uh, explaining and unpacking in her Canon Challenge. So if you haven't watched it, um, stop what you're doing and go and watch it right now. Come back, we'll be here. And um, it's cool to see Susan Howe thinking about, okay, like what does it mean to disrupt um, normative understandings of poetic language and how might that disruption be 
uh, related to um, other kinds of systemic refusal. And um, the thing that it feels important to me to mention in this context that those of us in Philly and perhaps many of us who are in other places are um, consumed with grief and rage at the um, police killing of Walter Wallace Jr. on Monday. And um, the language who polices questions of grammar to me in this moment uh, can't be anything other than a statement about state power. Uh, and I think that that's something that we get from week eight and from the language writers and even from Susan Howe is to think really carefully about like questions we've been asking about form uh, for the past seven, eight weeks are questions about how state power operates and affects bodies differently for reasons of race and class and gender. And those questions are not academic or hypothetical for the language poets, but um, really about disrupting language to uh, think about urgent questions about um, uh, how we manage systems of power differently. That's great, Davey, thank you. Um, I, I'd like to invite Allie to comment and then I'm gonna ask Gabe to follow up on that question, who polices questions of grammar. Um, I'm sure Allie will also comment it, but take, take police as far as you would like to go because I mean, Davey opened the door to a really important conversation about what, how, if, if people are languaged and questions of grammar are policed, that, that, that begs the question about who is actually policing, right? And in the context, the, it's not an analogy, it's, a, it's an equivalence that Davey pointed out to the situation with police. Now, the question is what is the relationship for writers, for the language poets, for others, for rather radical poets, uh, of this idea of police as not analogous, but language and, and other kinds of physical suppression have a relationship. So, Allie first and then Gabe, and then we're gonna move on to another poem. Um, I'm thinking about the way that we use the word um, contortion in, this week um, and how a lot of what the writers who were studying this week um, are kind of reacting against this expectation to contort themselves into like an existing or accepted language, right? Or like use of that language. Um, and I think part of what's amazing about the passage um, that Susan Howe passage that we just read is she's in, in talking about, you know, these are writers, Dickinson and Stein, who like pushed the limits um, of, of even sense, right? Like they get, they go just far enough to um, challenge being able to communicate with the reader that instead of like contorting themselves into something, um, they're asking the reader to come to them. Um, and it's, and think about like the everything productive that we can do by kind of contorting our minds to meet a writer where they are versus, um, versus needing to be um, kind of policed or dictated to by like what is already there, what's already accepted, what's already standard, what's default. You've made a, um... You made a really nice distinction. You put use the word verse verses, right? So, on one hand, we have this. Oh, I don't know. Um, liberatory seeking uh, uh, action of the of the poet trying to make a connection with readers that is, let's say, more democratic than the other side of the verses, where there is a confusion of authority and authorship and policing gets internalized by the author who thinks that he has written something that is truth and everybody needs to accept. And the question is, you know, we take a side in this course, clearly. We're not, we're not really interested in the other side of the verses. Um, and it's a kind of partisanship that needs to be fleshed out and needs to be admitted to, I think, by innovative poets and language poets are among you know, the early admitters of such a thing. Gabe, can you do something with police, the word police, which is, you know, kind of a big word in that passage? Yeah, what I was gonna say, maybe a little bit indirectly is, I think if the language poets have one thesis, it's that like the sense of self starts in language, starts in the mouth. Um, and, and I think what's 
sort of not always talked about is that a sense of self is also something other people hold for you, they receive from you and they do things with. And um, so much of communication is, is about missed presentation, misrepresentation, um, misunderstandings. And I, and I think that the language poets really, uh, one of the pieces of Davies piece that I, that I like is that questions of politics, questions of class and questions of labor are not like um, adjacent to language stuff. They are integral into the language poetry's work. So when I think about that policing of questions of grammar, I mean, I can think of it at the level of a state violence, something like the Parsley Massacre, or I can think of it in uh, ways in which misunderstanding, misunderstandings, mispresentations happen at the ordinary and become the basis on which we make our intimacies every single day. So I guess I think of it as a kind of viral thing that one of languages like propositions is that it asks you to kind right. of police it or regulate it in some sense. Uh, just the footnote on the Parsley Massacre, we're talking about Trujillo in 1937 and the massacre took place, correct me if I'm wrong, um, with a shibboleth that would separate those who could roll their R's and therefore a certain way and therefore be on the inside and those who couldn't were on the outside and would be slaughtered. Uh, are we talking about Guatemala maybe or Nicaragua? Sorry, I think Guatemala, yeah? No, Dominican Republic. Dominican no. Republic. Forgive but, me. Um, but it specifically it was mostly like the, the black immigrants or the black uh, Dominicans pronounced the word perejil in a particular way uh, in which the R was had a different sound to it. And it was used to sort of identify right. people. Yeah. Yes, and, and uh, Car Caroline Bergvall has has a project based on that, and it's it's and and it's available. There's a discussion available in Modpo Plus, so it actually makes the point really well that you just made.